Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's live coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit here at the Moscone Center in San Francisco. We are wrapping up four days wall-to-wall -wall coverage on theCUBE. I'm Rebecca Knight, your host, sitting alongside my co-host and co-analyst, Dave Vellante. It's developer day. The hoodies are out. Been quite a week. It has said. indeed. Yeah, it we really went from suits to hoodies. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I kind of like this crowd. I have to kind of admit, I've got to admit. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next two guests. We have John Adams, the VP of Architecture at VideoAmp. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE, John. And Jeff Holland, Head of Developer Tools at Snowflake. Thank you both for being here. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I want to start with you, John. Tell, tell our viewers a little bit about VideoAmp and how you work with Snowflake. Um, so VideoAmp is in the uh, media measurement, so content and ad measurement space. Uh, we leverage a lot of large data sets to go ahead and create something that's actionable for our like publishers and advertisers to transact upon. They want to know who's watching what, what those demographics are, and they want to be able to trust the data, right? They want to be able to know that, you know, when we say this many people saw it, um, this many people saw your ad, that there's not over-reporting, there's not under-reporting, and we leverage Snowflake for that. Uh, there's no other technology we've been able to find that would allow the volume of data that we have to be so actionable, so easy to process. Um, so yeah, uh, we're good Can I give you a card? Snowflake. This is the third guest <laughs> I know. that I'm like he a, is a doing, prospect yes, of. He, yeah. Seriously. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, We absolutely. do video, that's what we do all day, every day, and it's, it's a nightmare. Oh, there we go. The reporting of one company and another company, different platforms, you never know what you're looking at. Yep. Every, every, the de there's no standard definitions. We yep. need a semantic layer for video. <laughs> I would agree. John, he's there for you. No, but at a time, but all kidding aside, at a time in the attention economy where there is so much, so much pressure on these media organizations to, to get eyeballs and then to make sure that those eyeballs are in fact, we're counting them once. Um, it's really true, so you're, you're, you're doing some important work. So talk a little bit about the work you're doing. Um, so, as VP of Architecture at VideoAmp, like, I'm over security, I'm over our infrastructure, I'm over like platform, like APIs, like, you know, things that we're going to use across all of our products. So, we're building, um, like the products we're building, we're building planning tools for media agencies, we're building planning tools for advertisers, we're building measurement tools for both sides. Um, and a lot of the work we have to do is, you know, there's been a lot of regulations, there's been a lot of like, uh, work around privacy. We want to make sure that, you know, you're not, sharing uh, individuals' data with people that the individual hasn't opted into sharing. So we're heavily using Snowflake for like data clean room technologies, where two parties could come in, they could sh transact on their data together, but not actually have access to each other's data. So they're able to apply our methodology in the middle to actually surface like, you know, measurement, surface like, you know, what's the reach, what's the frequency, um, what are you actually seeing, you know, who's viewing your content, who's viewing your ad, um, and that's, all being built on Snowflake. So Jeff, um, what's, what's your perspective on the evolution of Snowflake? Uh, it went from hardcore database people, um, and now you're attracting you know, application developers, you're getting more folks that, in the company that understand the application environment. H how have you seen that, that journey? What's actually, what's your background? Um, because you're one of those folks that you know, has an affinity to developers, and, and how is the company's sort of culture evolving to support developers? Yeah, and it's, you know, along with the same types of thing that John's team is doing in VideoAmp, started obviously with this core of data, making sure that, hey, we need to be able to process these massive volumes of data so powerfully, but in the world we're moving into and have been in for a while, like data on its own needs so much more around it. And so Snowflake has been expanding for many years now into things like the Snowpark platform to say, okay, let's let you bring Python, let's let you bring containers, let you do more, both in terms of giving you more flexibility in the processing that you can do and bringing those applications to the data. And what we see and what gets us very excited is that because those volumes of data are so massive, if you can bring those apps to the data, you just get these massive price performance improvements. And then at Snowflake, one of the big things we care about on product is easy to use. So it's, hey, bring those things there. You mentioned the background, what brought me to Snowflake. Prior to Snowflake, I actually spent about a decade at Microsoft in their developer 
uh, cloud services. So things like serverless functions, serverless containers, working closely with GitHub and VS Code and those things. So I was much closer, you know, day to day working with app devs. But even then at the time, this was a few years ago now, was seeing the types of apps that people were building that bringing serverless functions to, it wasn't about generating the data as much as, hey, we have these massive amounts of data that exist. How do we make sense of it? How do we provide insights around that data? So I was like, oh, there's clearly this shift happening. Uh, we were talking even then at the time of data apps and this growth of data apps. Uh, so that drew me to, to Snowflake of like, okay, I got to go to where the momentum is going and, and help developers be productive in this world around data applications as well. So what's your brand promise to developers? How do you think about that? It's very similar to the one that we've talked about with the pieces on AI all up. It's like the easy to use, efficient, and secure. Like those are the three big pillars that, that even the developer pieces are built on. So it's, hey, you're doing development, we don't want you, you've got your cool Python script working, your Java script working. I don't want you to have to worry about fiddling with infrastructure, managing VMs, patching VMs, we're just going to run it at scale. That's part of the efficient piece. You're working with these massive volumes of data, don't worry about your data having to leave, go somewhere else, do the processing here, deal with the latency and the cost of pushing and pulling that data to different pieces, and then of course, secure. You want to make sure both the code that you're writing, that you can trust that code running next to your data. So there's a ton of effort there. And then just having those security promises that Snowflake is known for. So it, it aligns a lot with the messages we've been talking about all week. And John, is uh, Snowflake, from your standpoint, keeping its promises? Yeah, so historically, we ran a lot of workloads on Spark. Um, we've been around for a long time. We were using Snowflake and Spark, but a lot of our uh, processing for you know, actually taking the data that was being stored in Snowflake or being stored on HDFS or you know, other storage systems, we would go ahead and process this outside of Snowflake. And um, I spoke earlier this week about actually moving that processing into Snowflake because of Snowpark. So we're able to take a lot of our processing that we would be running on other systems, moving it in there, and the reason we did that is governance, right? I mean, we don't have to move our data around, we don't have to have exfiltration of our data, we don't have to have, I make my security guys very happy, they don't have to worry about data leaving the controlled environment to be processed, instead it gets processed right there, it's being done cheap, fast, um, I mean it's kind of a win-win for us. Okay, you're going off script. <laughs> <laughs> so last year at Summit, we, start, we heard some customers say, well, we're doing a lot of the hardcore data pipelining, data engineering, data science work outside of Snowflake. Really, why? Too expensive. Okay. I talked to Frank Slootman offline. I'm like, you know, we're hearing this a lot. He goes, they're wrong. They are. And I'm like, well, explain that to me, Frank. He goes, think about it. We do streaming. We do you know, really sophisticated analytics. We're bringing in AI. Yeah, we do, we're doing data engineering and, and data science work all in one place. And when you add all that up, it's going to be less expensive. And, and we started talking about it, and, and we're still trying to squint through this. So I want you know, the, the, the customer's opinion. Snowflake bundles in the AWS costs, right? When you go outside and you're just using Spark, you're paying AWS separately, so it's not in, you know, it's all not in one bundle. So you, somebody's got to do the work to add it up and actually do the, 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 the out-of-pocket cost, but then there's all the other costs of securing and governing, so you said, he's right. Yeah. Um, explain from your perspective. So one of the interesting things, when we were, we had a large data center, right? So we had like, you know, two petabytes of data sitting in our data center. We would go ahead and take a lot of data that we were mastering in Snowflake, we would have to pay egress costs. So a lot of the processing that we were able to do and spend you know, a couple million bucks a year on this data center, we're now running that workload on Snowflake for cheaper than our egress costs from AWS to our data center. So like the cost it took us to actually ship this data was more than was taken to actually process it in Snowflake. And one of the big reasons for that, like people look at Snowflake's like billing model and they say, oh, you're paying a lot per credit. But it's like, you're paying for the seconds you're using. So if you can actually have something that would traditionally take you 20 minutes on Spark, plus the spin up time, plus the spin down time, plus the like, you know, data transfer time, and you can run that in two, three minutes on Snowflake, I'll, I'll pay a multiplier on that time. Because like Snowflake is eating the cost of having these servers available for you. you know, they're paying Amazon to have this, the infrastructure ready for you to run, but I don't have to worry about paying for that time. 
I just pay for what I'm using. So because the compute engine is so efficient, you're saying? It's efficient and it's ready for you to actually query. And John's not alone in this either. We've actually done an analysis of, of over 30 customers over the last year who've gone from Spark to Snowpark. And on average across them, we see 35% less expensive. And that includes calculating like the infrastructure cost as well and three to four times faster on average. And the reason is like there's the data movement. If you think about it too, the amount of steps geeking out a little bit on developer day, like you've got to take data that is stored here natively in Snowflake with our engine. To go process it anywhere else, you've got to deserialize the data, push it across an egress pipeline, serialize it over here, process it there, and then send it back again and back and forth and back and forth. All those things are just steps that when you run it natively inside of Snowflake with Snowpark, all that goes away, so you get this cheaper, faster, more efficient. Piece. And I want to understand that. So the, the, what you just described is, is labor intensive, so it's, it's, it's human? labor that is required to do that, or are there other But it's even heavier I mean, just on tech, it's like laws of I physics know. almost. There's like laws of physics advantages on top of the fact that like the Snowflake Elastic Engine, one of the core pieces when we were building Snowpark, and the reason we built those Snowpark the way that we did is like, look, we have this core engine that you know Benoit and Terry and founders have built together that does this incredible elastic scale. That's the exact same engine that's processing the Python workloads. So just pushing down to that gives benefits, and then there's just laws of physics benefits in terms of we don't move the data anywhere. We see what you want to do, you described it in Python, and we'll just push that down to the data. So just keeping the data in there, reducing those steps, we optimize the full end to end, you get these massive benefits. So I'm sorry to keep pushing on this, but I really want to understand it. So if I understand it correctly, the business case is around, would be around time to value is much greater. And it's, it's somewhat soft, but that's why, the same thing with the cloud. I don't know, cost, it's the agility. I can do stuff that I couldn't do before. Am, am I, is that correct? And I, I would say time, I think the one that gets the most people excited, and John, I'd love to hear your perspective though, it's the, it's the cost though. Like all up, we've seen time and time again, you're paying a certain amount of cost to do processing in Spark, wherever you have that Spark to do. There is a human cost to this. Like, you know, oh, I've got to go make sure I've ordered this right, and do I have my Z partition set up the right way, and I've got to maintain these things. That is a cost to all of it, but if you just look at how much money are we spending to get our data to a state that we can act on it, Snowpark can get you just lower costs all up. You will just spend less money and do it faster. It's like a, it's a, it's a win-win. Weigh in on this, if you would. So, interesting thing with Snowflake, or Snowpark, or Snowflake in general, is like, the time it takes to do something and the costs are inversely proportional. But you're only paying for the time that you're using. So if I want to sit here and I'm, I'm running, a, say, a, a medium warehouse, and I'm like, you know what, I want this to be half the, half the time, half the wall clock time. I'm going to go ahead and make it a large, I'm going to get it done in half the time, and if I'm efficient with how I'm managing my warehouse, I'm going to pay the same amount of of cost. And you really can't do that in a lot of other systems. Other systems, you're going to provision new cluster to do new things, you're going to have a lot of fixed costs. So we're seeing that. We are seeing that it's, we can get fast, we can get cheap, and... I've done a lot of um, TCO analysis in my day, and I'll give an example. So when you do Oracle TCO analysis, the software license is everything, right? It's not usually the case with other you know, systems, right? It's usually labor costs or a combination of things. My question is, in that, in that pie, how much of the blame pie goes to egress versus those others? Is it more balanced or is it, like if egress was, were no cost, would that equation flip? Uh, I, I, if I look at costs all up, I don't think the equation flips at all. I haven't done the, the deep, like I don't know exactly, you, you would know more about your bill. Got I know feel. egress was a big part. For us, no. I mean, the egress cost was, I mean, if we look at what we were spending on egress versus what we were spending for our data center, just the process, the, the Spark workloads, it was dropping the bucket. So when I say that Snowpark's cheaper, like, I don't know if I should share the numbers, but like, I, I shared it on the presentation. So we, yeah, we well, have about 90% yeah, uh, cost savings. 90, nine yeah. zero. Nine zero. So 10% of. Is what we expect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. That's great, you guys are passing my tests here. I appreciate <laughs> it. I, I, since you told me you were a, a former CISO um, in a painful life, paper right, right. So, I want to ask you about the developer perspective on securing, you know, shift left is sort of the bromide, and, and how that experience is different, or is it different in, in Snowflake. So, it's kind of like the cloud became the first line of defense, but then the developers were asked to secure the code, and they're like, all right, well, that, if I have to. And so, what's your perspective on the developer experience in the context of having to worry about all that security and governance, and, and how is the experience inside of Snowflake? Well, it's interesting, like, 
it's a lot easier in Snowflake than it should be. I mean, I think it's because you know Snowflake follows pretty normal standards. You can lay out a nice uh, RBAC structure, right? Really easily, and it's transparent to the developer. Then you can sit here and like Snowflake introduced a thing a few years back, which was like secondary roles, which allows you to compose all of your access, it, like while you're going ahead and doing reads and writes, and you don't have to worry about what role you're part of. So like, you know, when I'm managing like, a, let's say a provisioning of a user and I want to give them a bunch of different roles, the developer doesn't even have to switch between them. They have a composition of all that access and I can take away access very easily without changing the workflow at all. And then when we actually think about like securing Snowflake's account, like a part of provisioning a Snowflake account, you're, as you're working with your sales engineer, you're spinning this stuff up, they're going to go ahead and walk you through, hey, let's enable MFA, let's make sure we have like private link enabled, let's make sure that we harden your system. It's like one of the checklists of onboarding on a Snowflake anyways. So it's, I mean, the, for the developers, it's not much. They go, they click in the Okta, they get into the interface, uh, they'll probably be on their VPN if they're using private link. They're going to be secure. The, you know, nothing's leaving their network. And then they're going to go ahead and you know, use the tool. Now, if they don't have access to a table, they're not going to see the table. Right. And then you have additional like, controls that have been added. And I'm, I'm going to ramble, I'm sorry. This, no, this is, <laughs> this is beautiful, I'm loving this. Like the controls, you, know, you start having like, data masking policies, you have row level access policies, you have all these additional controls, you have like, uh, aggregation policies. You start putting these things onto the tables, uh, subsequent views and whatnot, they're like, down the like, you know, further right in the pipeline, they're built on top of this, inherit these same capabilities. So I go ahead and I, maybe I have access to a table that maybe I shouldn't, but I definitely shouldn't be seeing the sensitive data in that table. As long as there's an access policy on that, that or a, a, like a, a data masking policy on that, I'm not going to see the data. It's going to be obstructed or like obfuscated away, it's going to be encrypted, it's going to be masked. And if I, like, say, two, two, of my custom, like, two of my account reps are using the same shared table, and they're going to maybe have a different access to different subsets of accounts based off right. the region, they're going to only see, like, I put a uh, row level access policy on there. Any views built off of that table, anything downstream built off of that table, they're only going to see the customers they actually have access to. So, like, not just from a, developer's per a developer perspective, but also, like, a user perspective, it becomes, like, super safe and transparent and, uh, term we used earlier that you hear from Benoit is easy. And so yeah. Simplify, uh, simplify, simplify. I'm dominating it's, the it, conversation here, Rebecca. You, this is conversation is getting very geeky. <laughs> so yes, let's talk about the future. I'm interested in both of your perspective on this, this new era of generative AI that we're living through and how it will change how developers do their jobs. I mean, I'm going to start with you, Josh. Sure, I, I think there's two vectors to it. One is that generative AI really gives developers a new set of superpowers. Like, I, this is what I love. They so, weren't powerful enough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> if they didn't have enough power already. <laughs> so it's the, the co-pilots, the, the editing, so many different flavors, and Snowflake is embedding AI into all these pieces to make it so that, again, if we talk about some of the time required, we'll just have AI help augment. So that's one side of those investments that I think is very, very exciting and, and disruptive. But the other part too is just the type of apps. Like the next generation of applications that are going to be providing value are all going to be centered around AI. And especially around enterprises, those types of apps are always going to need some systems of record, some valuable data to make them powerful. So I think it's just going to accelerate the shift into saying, look, it's not data and apps, it's really like these data to the apps piece. I, there's no other way to do it in generative AI that I see. So that, that to me is very exciting and why I get very excited to be able to work at Snowflake to have that uh, ability to have a platform that's so purpose ready for this new generation of generative AI apps. Um, what would you like to be able to say 12 months from now? So I go back to last year at, at uh, Summit, uh, Snowpark Container Services was the big announcement, at least I thought that was the big one, and I said, all right, well, I want to see developers actually using that next year, and I want to see more you know, folks in the ecosystem. We, we're seeing that. What do, you want to, what do you want to be able to say 12 months from now uh, that you can't say today, AKA, what do you want to see Snowflake deliver? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, Let me get ready to write it down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the big ones is, um, like I said, we're big users of the data clean room, ah. right? Data clean room is a native application. It's great. It gives us the ability to like have this like trusted relationship with our partners. And I would like to see data clean room and any like security like governance like capability, private link, whatnot. When something goes GA, it's there. Like so, like. We already saw that today, or this week, with uh, Snowpark Container Services being available in native apps. 
there's so many people in an industry, like data, data privacy is so important. Like data, like stewardship is so important. I want to make sure that like the data clean room fully supports all the capabilities of Snowflake, Snowpark, um, right off the bat. Got that, Jeff? Yeah, I got it, I got it, yes. <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry. we're looking forward to the next summit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank I want to just wrap because okay. we're, we're done. Go for it. We're we done, are done. Right? This is so it. we have to this say, I mean, this has been a fantastic show. Thank you guys for helping us, helping us wrap. To me, my takeaways are the, the plumbing is actually really robust here, and, and Snowflake is building on top of that. The Polaris uh, announcement, op open sourcing, the technical metadata catalog, uh, and, and then enticing people to come back into Snowflake with Horizon and all that wonderful governance is going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I think that building, that because they have such robust plumbing and, the, and a really good compute engine, they can now build things on top of it. They can bring in Gen AI, Cortex, uh, the NVIDIA stuff with, with NIMS, kind of supercharges Cortex, and then of course the applications piece is really exciting, the vision of iPhone for data apps. There's a new set of applications coming. Data is like the new development kit. John Furrier said that 10 years ago, but it's actually now happening. Um, and it brings Snowflake into a whole new realm with uh, new competitors. And it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. I'm, I'm super excited to, for you guys. And, uh, uh, it's, it's fun to be on and I'm excited to share whatever in the next few months of, of how that journey's been going. So yeah. Great. Now, thank you. Oh, thank you. It was, this it, week it's been me. a great show. As you said, a great show. I've really enjoyed myself here at Snowflake. And thank you for watching alongside of us here at theCUBE. This has been the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit 2024 at the Moscone Center. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante and all of us here at theCUBE, thank you for tuning in. You've been watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.